Welcome. Thank you for spending your time and skipping the lost testimony to come see me. <laughs> uh, makes me feel great. So uh, I'm here to talk about automotive bootloaders. Uh, so I guess first of all, uh, a little bit about who I am. Uh, I'm Phil Lepchinski, so it's it's lap with all the consonants and then ski. Uh, I'm a software engineer, a senior staff engineer at a uh, Renaissance, and we make chips and all kinds of things. So, what am I here to talk about? Embedded bootloaders uh, in automotive. So what does a bootloader do? Um, essentially it owns the reset vector in the microcontroller, um, and on reset, the bootloader is going to determine if your application is valid or not. Um, if it's valid, it allows you to load the application. Um, and on a big system on a chip, it might, it might uh, copy that over into RAM and execute it. Uh, for embedded devices, though, it typically will just jump to the start vector of your application. Uh, also, in like deeply embedded devices, the bootloader usually allows you to reprogram the memory, uh, the flash in the micro. So, uh, can you guys see, oh, you guys see the mouse. So here you have the, the ruler vector. Jump into the bootloader, it's gonna do some stuff, determine if it's, you have a valid application or not, and then jump to the application vector. So, we've got these in the car, we know that they're in there. Uh, how do we talk to them? Well, it makes, we, we make it easy in automotive. Uh, we have a proprietary connector for OBD, and you have to get special dongles, like, the Car Hacking Village yes. dongle. <laughs> so everybody go buy one of those, they're 80 bucks. <laughs> um, but that allows us to connect to the CAN bus. So that's defined by uh, ISO protocol, uh, released in 86, but it's uh, 2008 become mandatory. So we know that any vehicle after 2008, uh, it's in there, we can talk to it. And so that's the physical layer um, connected through the OBD2 dongle. To start talking to these things, so CAN, only eight byte payloads. Um, that doesn't give us a lot of information. We can send small commands, but we can't send like large amounts of data. So, I know. <laughs> so we got the transport layer, 15765. Um, that's the underlying transport layer that sits on top of CAN and between uh, CAN and the diagnostic layer. So this basically allows us to send uh, payloads up to uh, 4K by segmenting the messages. So, on top of that, we're just gonna make layers and layers and layers of protocols to make it confusing. Uh, we've got ISO 14229, and that's Unified Diagnostic Services. So, this is a ISO spec that basically um, defines a whole bunch of common services, uh, essentially creating the API. It's uh, client server, so you send it a request with your client, and the server running on the ECU will send the response. Um, essentially, this, this uh, spec defines all of the different standard services. Uh, there can be also OEM or supplier-specific services as well. Um, and there's also security levels, so there's different sessions uh, to get elevated privileges. For bootloaders, we're typically talking about the programming session. ISO defines session two as the programming session, so if you send a session control uh, change request to go into the programming session, now you go into the bootloader. So this is where things get interesting. And I guess before I jump to that, let me explain. Um, on an embedded device in automotive, uh, the bootloader is typically a whole separate uh, executable program uh, that's separately compiled from the application. So um, there's some kind of inter-process communication that happens between like your normal application and the bootloader when you're sending, uh, passing the information through. So that's usually done through like a reset. So you might get a programming, like a session uh, control request, and it'll set some flags and then cause a reset and then the bootloader says, oh hey, I'm in programming session, let's go do something interesting. So. What does this look like, the, the typical programming sequence? Um, it's, it's broken up into three distinct uh, kind of groups. There's this pre-programming sequence, which happens before you program. There's the programming sequence, <laughs> which is when you're doing the programming, 
These are really easily named. And then the post-programming sequence, which I bet you guys can guess, it's after you program. All right, so pre-programming, what happens here? Um, this is like usually OEM specific, um, really what you're doing. Uh, but in, in the, the ISO spec, there's, there's common things that typically happen. Um, oftentimes, you'll do a session control and jump into this, the extended session, so that's ser session three. And the extended diagnostic session gives you like uh, s elevated services than your normal diagnostic default session that would be like you're driving around in the car. Um, so what you do is you go into this extended session and you start doing things that are going to prepare the vehicle for programming. So one of the common things is to turn off DTCs because so I'm going to like change my you know the software my application software on the the car and all these other ECUs are still talking to each other or they're looking for messages. So if I have a ECU that's down, not you know sending its messages, everybody else that relies on my messages is going to say what the hell's going on. Uh, it'll start setting DTCs, it'll, you know, it doesn't know what's going on. So typically uh, when the diagnostic tester is going to initiate a programming session, it's, it, it turns off all the DTCs, it might turn off, uh, disable the non-diagnostic communication, and so say, okay, everybody be quiet on the bus because I want to start reprogramming ECUs. Um, this may or may not require security access to get into this uh, session. Again, this is all OEM specific and the OEM specs are all secretly guarded and under NDA. And there's a bunch of OEM people here that they weren't, they don't let me tell the secrets. <laughs> uh, so then there's the programming step. And uh, this, is, this is when you basically activate the bootloader um, and, and unlock it. Uh, UDS defines a security seed key exchange, so service 27. And you basically, the, the tester will say, hey, go give me a seed, sends the seed back, and then the tester will uh, send the response. It's the challenge response protocol. Um, but again, the way this is programmed, the actual algorithm is not defined by ISO. That's defined specifically by the OEM. Um, one thing to note, you know, again, the industry is continually trying to strive for its better security, um, but historically, um, OEMs didn't always do a great job with their security algorithms. It might be a secret algorithm that's, you know, some engineer made up one day. Um, and the secrecy of it is because it's hidden in a desk somewhere. Um, but lots of smart reverse engineers out there that can uh, figure things like, like that out. Um, so historically, this is, that, that's been a problem. Um, the industry's working towards better types of uh, security there and also other things like uh, better entropy on the seeds. That's a, another problem. Anyway, uh, so you unlock this thing, Service 27. Um, there may be some um, write data by identifier service where you write like a fingerprint or some specific information. So this is typically like the tester might do like um, write the programming date. Uh, into the ECU, like the last time it did it, or write its like serial number, so like the tester serial number into it, and say, hey, this was flashed by, you know, Ben's serial number. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Um, <laughs> very professional. Uh, so then what it'll do is, is uh, again, this is, a lot of this stuff is, it's defined by ISO, but exactly how it's done is, is OEM specific. So some, some uh, OEMs will have a secondary bootloader that you download and typically what's in that is like the actual flash routines. So residing in the ECU normally they're not in there so you can't like just you know gain uh, do like some buffer overflow and, and get into there and write, rewrite the ECU because the, the code for that's not even in there. Um, the the uh, flash drivers are actually downloaded by the tester um, and they're set up specifically for that ECU. So you download that and then you activate that. Um, and so that, that enables now the uh, programming routines. So the next thing that happens then um, is we're going to get into this. So once we've activated the bootloader, we're going to get into this uh, download step. And the, w the way that looks is um, you have a request download, so service 34, uh, which says you send basically your address and the length um, 
And there's different types of addressing, like some OEMs will have like actual address-based uh, addressing. Some uh, have what's called like logical blocks, where you give it the logical block identifier. Um, again, it's all of the stuff is, is proprietary. Um, then you have the service uh, 36, which is the transfer data. So you're sending this, and you can send basically you know 4K at a time um, until you have all of your data there. Once that's happened, uh, you do a transfer data exit. And so this is typically where you do something like a checksum or do an integrity check of all of this data before activating it. Um, so there may be like a uh, routine control after that that says, hey, do this check routine and uh, you know, check the checksum on it. That's the, the, the basic least secure way is just doing the checksum. Um, you know, it, it varies wildly. It's all OEM specific and uh, proprietary. So uh, a lot of times this could be also where you do like the code signing check verification. But um, really that could be done in the transfer data exit or it could be done with a special routine. It's, it's all um, up to an OEM to decide how to do that in their specifications. So, okay, all the data's got there. Uh, we sent it to the um, ECU. We verified that the data is good. It's it's good to go. It looks authentic-ish. Now, what happens? Um, the tester will say, "Okay, go back into the diagnostics or the extended session." Uh, we start getting it ready for the post programming. So you turn the DTCs back on because now your application is all working great, and uh, you can turn the normal diagnostic communication, non-diagnostic communications on, uh, and then you usually do like a session control to the default session. And so this usually happens through like a reset. So the bootloader says, "Okay, we're done. We reset, and you jump back into the application." So, okay, now that you have, like, the most basic understanding of how ECU bootloaders um, or automotive bootloaders uh, work, how are these used potentially uh, as an attack vector? Well, there's lots of things that it can do. Uh, it's a very powerful, it's its own application. And so um, just by what it does, its normal operation, um, it necessity, like by necessity, has to do things like, well, it prevents the application from running because it's its own application. So if you can say, hey, go into the bootloader, well, now the application is not working. Um, and why would you want to turn the application off? Well, uh, what if you're trying to like spoof messages? Um, if you're spoofing messages on the bus and the ECU is also sending out its valid messages, well, now you're, you have this contention um, or confliction. <laughs> <laughs> if you like to make up words. Um, the, uh, <laughs> so if, if you have this, um, you know, now you can turn, turn the CCU off and you can send its messages and spoof the messages. Uh, most automotives right now uh, are not using, like CAN is not, by the protocol itself, is not sending authenticated messages. It's a bus protocol. So if I send messages with this ID, with this signal, I can now, you know, the ECUs that are listening to this can, can now have to listen to it if it's if you're on the same bus and all those other things. So to turn the ECU off um, and send your own messages and spoof those. Uh, it's also it, it is auto reset the decision maker, right? It's deciding is this application valid or not. And meaning you could also say if you can make it so that it thinks the application is not valid, well now it's not going to run that application and you're permanently disabled, or if you can somehow subvert the um, validity checks, now you can execute non-signed code or you can execute whatever you want, right? Uh, it also, by nature, has ways to input data or export data, you know, exfiltrate data. So some OEMs implement request upload, part of the ISO spec, um, it's, it's available. Uh, the general practice is, is not to do that because then you could just send requests to pull all the code out of there, your firmware. Um, but it's some OEMs do it or the supplier implements it for whatever reason. Um, by the nature of the bootloader, you can write data to it, request download. That's 
you know, if you can uh, write something into RAM, uh, then maybe you can execute it. Like uh, a couple slides back, we've got this programming step where you're downloading a flash driver. So that's basically downloaded and run out of RAM. Uh, you can read interesting data, right? There's the service 22, uh, read data by ID. So if you have IDs, we can read certain things out of there. That might be interesting in getting things out of it. Uh, it uh, again, it might have, because it's its own separate application, it's a different session, uh, there may be different DIDs available than what are in the application. So there's more or at least different information sometimes uh, out of the bootloader. You may be able to read a specific spot in memory. There's a service 23, read memory by address. And again, these are all like, these are just the ISO services that are defined, right? Um, it's, you know, you can look them up online. Uh, write specific parameter data. So write data by ID, that's available. Uh, write memory by address, that's, you know, that's a service. Uh, so usually there's range checking and stuff in there if it's done, implemented correctly. Um, but again, there's, you know, there's a lot of powerful things available um, if you can get around, you know, security um, there. Uh, another attack vector is uh, man in the middle of the programming sequence. So if you have a valid tester, even without knowledge of, you know, the, the security or anything like that, you may be able to record the programming sequence, you may be able to replay certain parts of it, um, you could potentially intercept firmware over the wire uh, because lots of OEMs don't like encrypt the data once it gets to the CAN bus. It might be encrypted at rest, it might be encrypted in the cloud when they pull it down, but um, the, the, the ECU doesn't have like the symmetric keys in it to like decrypt the firmware, so um, it's usually just transmitted over, you know, unencrypted. Um, again, this, you know, it's all OEM specific and people are moving towards encrypted firmware, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, that could be, with a valid tester, that could be easier than, um, you know, trying to get JTAG on a device and, and pulling the firmware, right, if you can just snoop it off the bus. Um, again, I, I mentioned this before, replay attacks on certain sequences. So if, it's, if the tester is validly doing something uh, interesting, maybe you can record that in CAN and then replay it. And how would you do something like that? Well, um, or I'll get to that in a second. Uh, also, by nature of what the tools have to do, right, um, the, the, the programming tool is going to have the images, right? You have to flash these images to the ECU. So uh, if the tool itself is not well protected, um, that may be like an easier attack vector than trying to like, you know, get a buffer overflow in a bootloader or uh, trying to get JTAG or somehow like taking this, you know, pulling the firmware off the ECU uh, because the programming tool itself uh, needs to have the firmware because it's sending it to the ECU. Uh, you can also get information about the proprietary programming sequences and things like that because, um, you know, unless you have specs from an OEM or, um, you know, have access to this stuff, um, it's all highly secretly guarded, right? Uh, also, uh, anytime, you know, it's using any kind of like symmetric keys, like if it's the CT algorithm is not authenticated all the way to like a back end, uh, the tool itself, you know, may have the symmetric keys for seed key. So instead of trying to reverse engineer this firmware or, you know, hack into an HSM on a, a ECU, uh, the, the programming tool might just have all the algorithms in it. Another thing that's uh, awesome about UDS is that, so the, <laughs> the way the seed key is designed is basically it's like a, you know, it's like a blind butler, like the, you do the secret knock and he opens the door and then anybody can go in. So once you've, you know, once you've unlocked the ECU or gotten into that session, then you can just kind of keep that session alive uh, from a valid tester and then send whatever messages you want. Um, so kind of snooping a, um, a valid session, you could hijack that and send kind of other things. Um, and so having access to these testers or if you're on the bus at the same time, it's kind of, you have lots of access there. Other attack vectors, uh, a bootloader Trojan. So, you know, there's ways to even gain persistence on an ECU. 
um, by uh, downloading a bootloader that overwrites the bootloader, right? Um, there's products that, that do this for updating bootloaders. Um, and essentially you, you program an application into the, as the, the new application it has to look like a valid application and then it just overwrites your bootloader with its own bootloader. You might lose your keys, you might, you know, now you gain permanent persistence on the ECU. So, what makes this even more scary? Um, so before, for all of this, you had to have physical access to the vehicle, right? Um, so it doesn't scale well. Um, I can't physically walk to a thousand or a million different vehicles and start changing the firmware on them. Uh, but don't worry, everyone solved this problem because now everyone wants to add over-the-air programming. So many OEMs are incorporating this. Um, implementing it just like a diagnostic tester that's connected to the internet, right? So depending on how secure that is, um, that can put in a lot of challenges, right? Uh, OT is awesome. Uh, it's great for fixing bugs. We can add features. We can do security updates. It it's helps facilitate, uh, you know, rolling out um, recalls, like fixing recalls and stuff, because you can push these things out quickly. But um, OTA basically is, is remote code execution, and generally that's bad <laughs> in terms of a security model. Uh, so it's, it's like, it, it's, it, it's the savior, but it's also the, the thing that can really hurt us. It's kind of a two-edged sword. Um, and it opens up some interesting uh, challenges that we might not have had before. So uh, attacks on like repositories itself, um, there's, you know, DEF CON's huge, right? There's all kinds of fun uh, talks going on. I'm sure somebody maybe this year or, or certainly in the previous years have talked about like uh, repository uh, attacks on updaters like for Ubuntu and, um, you know, uh, Windows Update and all that. Same thing with, with automotive, right? If we're doing OTA updates, um, it's opening up attack vectors for, you know, actual trading code, um, signing keys, um, you know, repository poisoning, things like that. Um, also, um, there's some challenges in keeping OTA going because uh, the, the car has intermittent connectivity. You know, if it's parked in a garage, it doesn't, you might not have access for who knows, right? Or somebody might park this car in a garage for 20 years and then turn it on and now you have, you know, six million software updates. You can't drive your car for three weeks because it's downloading. <laughs> uh, and then like man in the middle type attacks to the vehicle, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's literally a moving network, computer network. So it's, it's a really challenging IT problem to maintain this kind of infrastructure and, and the securing all of that. So um, there's a lot of new challenges that could prevent updates or pass bad information to the cloud or to the vehicle. Um, and so it kind of, it's pushing you know, OEMs to have to really think about the full end-to-end um, -end life cycle for updates. Oh yeah, and cars move. So um, if you brick your phone, usually that's, you know, that's a bummer, but if you brick somebody's car and they're in the middle of, I don't know, the desert, um, they're not gonna be particularly happy. Uh, there's also all kinds of like, OTA attacks. Um, there's a so there's a, pro a project called Obtain um, that's doing like a security um, model framework for for OTA attacks, and they've kind of enumerated a whole bunch of different things, um, like uh, malicious software attacks. Uh, you know, updating, trying to poison the cache with bad updates, uh, freeze attacks where you're stopping the. Um, basically stopping the updates from happening by slowing it down, uh, or uh, maybe you have like bad uh, vulnerable software trying to get the ECU to roll it back to a bad version. Um, it, it is a lot of challenges and lots of ways to like uh, DOS the system. So it's, it's quite a bit, big challenge. So uh, now that I bummed everybody out, or, or maybe made them excited because maybe they're trying to hack cars. Uh, <laughs> this is the car hacking village, right? Um, <laughs> so what are we, what, what's the industry trying to do uh, to make it more secure? And for people that don't care about that, that also means what might not be implemented right now. 
uh, things like code signing, right? Where uh, you take a message digest, you're signing it with private key, appending that to the data, and then uh, verifying it uh, on the ECU side. So this is one of the, like uh, I mentioned that Optane project, uh, this is one of the things that that project is really trying to like set up delegations for how you make a signature scheme for automotive really fault tolerant uh, against different types of attacks. So uh, a lot of work being done there. Uh, secure boot, push and secure boot. Uh, you know, so this is like building a chain of trust to ensure the authenticity and integrity of code at startup. Uh, small ECUs that have just like a um, like a she module, which is like a small HSM. Um, you know, these might have like a really simple secure boot, but if you get into like the systems on a chip, uh, that there's the main mainline talk I think yesterday um, about the Qualcomm firmware, and he showed like the the Qualcomm firmware secure boot chain, and it was like it was like 45 different things. <laughs> so each one of these might have like could have a vulnerability, right? And you have to try to protect that whole thing. So uh, these can get really complicated and really really tricky, and um, also. Who owns the keys uh, for a secure boot chain? Is it becomes really uh, complicated because it could be in, in automotive we have this big, huge supply chain, and uh, different stakeholders might need to own different parts of it. So, like an OEM might want to own some things, but the original equipment, uh, like a tier one supplier, might also you know need a stake in it. So it's like uh, these things can get really complicated, and they're hard. To, they're tricky to really secure but we're working on it <laughs> um, uh, another big thing like this is you know what what uh, I, I work on all the time uh, hardware security modules so uh, this is like hardware acceleration to help facilitate some of these things so like uh, I mentioned before uh, you know you've got the seed key so um, off, one of the big problems with that is like really, really poor entropy on your uh, seeds. So somebody might just implement, because we don't have like, there's no like real time clock, there's no, you know, good timers, you don't have a good source of entropy on these ECUs. Um, so, if, you know, people would, would implement this like super awesome proprietary random jumper generator and, you know, it, it throws out four different random numbers or something. <laughs> so it's really easy to replay these seeds. Um, so hardware facilitated true random number generation that really helps with certain things like that. Um, protected key storage, uh, AES hardware acceleration uh, for symmetric crypto or other symmetric crypto accelerators, uh, having public key crypto accelerators in there. Um, and again, you know, the idea is to uh, protect all the keys and also try to help accelerate some of these things so that we can do, uh, enable things like real-time authentication and um, encryption and message authentication and things like that. Um, there's also uh, things to like enable secure boot uh, in hardware. Uh, one of the challenging things with this though is that there's not like a one spec to rule them all uh, in automotive. So a lot of stuff is using like TPMs uh, for, you know, in like IoT or, or um, uh, PCs and, you know, traditional IT. Uh, in automotive, there's this like, baseline specification from the this is like the the hilarious uh, uh, German pun here they called it the his she um, <laughs> so this uh, his is like the Hirschteller initiative software it's like a uh, consor consortia of, of like a bunch of German um, suppliers and, and OEMs uh, and they created this she spec which is a secure hardware extension um, and it, it just defined like certain things uh, in hardware that that would um, that they, they specified for uh, security. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a standalone peripheral. And so a lot of silicon vendors have implemented that um, and have, have support for that. But um, OEMs are, you know, moving even beyond that. Uh, a lot of people need more keys or they need, you know, more specific stuff like a secure execution environment. Uh, there's a, there's a, another, there was another few years later, um, group in Europe uh, called Avita. It was like a government EU-sponsored um, consortia. And they came up with like another spec that kind of divided it up into like three different uh, levels. So this low, medium, uh, full Avita spec. And so this like the highest one, you know, has a, a secure uh, code execution, a co-processor and everything like that. 
Um, so again, Silk Inventors are like implementing stuff like that. Like we have one called ICUM for that. Um, but other, other silicon vendors like NXP has the CSC, which is the cryptographic services engine, and Finion's got their own stuff. Um, Arm has uh, the Trust Zone. And, you know, there's, there's been a bunch of talks on Trust Zone hacking stuff. So if you're interested in that, um, there's lots of information on Trust Zone stuff. So it's, it's, um, it, it's kind of a big challenge because, uh, because there are so many different varieties and uh, there's no, like, just common, you know, API for, okay, here's the automotive API and spec for building uh, this, this secure hardware as a, a chip vendor. So um, every OEM kind of just has their own, their own flavor of how it works. So again, this is a challenge, but uh, there's also, you know, committees that are working on kind of creating uh, more common specs. There's a SAE group for that, um, and there's also a uh, ISO group that's working on kind of like common security practices. Uh, some more stuff. So ECU hardening. Um, this is just like general security, uh, good hygiene stuff. But you know, you'd be surprised how often this doesn't happen <laughs> uh, and most of the OEMs have specs now that say like yeah you have to lock the JTAG um, uh, or you know tamper protection things like um, if the tamper protection is detected it erases your keys out of the HSM so even if somebody gains access they can't get the keys out um, or can't use the you know can't use the thing um, again good crypto hygiene don't use the same key across all of your cars um, like some OEMs have done, um, <laughs> uh, but the, you know this hardware stuff basically helps um, enable some of the higher level like protocol level kind of security, um, like doing authenticated CAN. So there's a thing called um, AutoSAR, which is like a software and uh, it's open standard software initiative or something. I, offhand, I'm forgetting what it stands for. I should know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but anyway, uh, it it defines uh, like a protocol for doing secure, authenticated communication on CAN, um, and also authenticated diagnostics. So there's not um, any kind of specification for this right now. But OEMs, this is all OEM proprietary stuff. But um, you know what the industry is working on basically is enabling you know much better authentication for diagnostics so instead of like having a tool that has all the symmetric keys in it and you know being able to have access there you have to go out to like an actual server and it sends you know some signed piece of information that you can verify with a public key so i'm gonna do it on time um so on summary here bootloaders give you powerful access to automotive ecus um we started adding OTA to these things, and it's making everyone's lives really difficult. <laughs> but it's keeping us all employed, so that's good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it really opens up the attack service for remote exploitation. It's making, uh, you know, it's the enabler to be able to do updates and to push um, security patches and things like that, but it makes, makes stuff extremely difficult. Um, I think automotive uh, vehicles is one of the most difficult things to do OTA on because it's this big thing that's moving that could smash into something. And then, of course, um, you know, we're working on this. We're working on securing the ECUs, uh, but are we doing it fast enough? Um, are, we, are we there yet? And the, of course, the answer is no. We're still working on, still working on that. <laughs> uh, it's it's improving all you know incrementally, of course. So, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you guys taking your time to, you know lose your happy hour drink prices and sit here and watch and listen to me so <laughs> uh.